Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA is a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. For more than 60 years, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has held to a singular and enduring mission to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. Working with innovators inside and outside of government, DARPA has repeatedly delivered on that mission, transforming revolutionary concepts and even seeming impossibilities into practical capabilities. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's programs, partners, and performers. My name is Randy Atkins, and I'll be your DARPA host today. Climate change is usually thought of as a slow motion catastrophe. There have been warnings about its potentially devastating effects for decades. The changes are generally gradual and, so far, usually subtle. We talk about impacts in terms of decades into the future. But what if major, vast, and permanently life-altering climate changes happened all of a sudden? Tipping points are a whole nother level. These are changes that have been documented in the paleoclimate record as having occurred in the past. Sudden and effectively irreversible changes in key parts of the Earth's system leading to really significant changes in the Earth's climate or in, in parts of the biosphere. There's still a whole lot of work to be done in order to get our understanding of climate to the point where we can A, really understand the risks and and quantify the risks, and B, have the kinds of data and knowledge that we need to actually do real adaptation to those risks. Joshua Elliott is a DARPA program manager leading its AI-assisted climate tipping point modeling program, which aims to advance artificial intelligence and machine learning to better model the complex processes related to climate so that we can forecast the timing and extent of potentially sudden and drastic changes to our planet. My background is extremely eclectic. My PhD is in theoretical particle physics. And when I finished that and was trying to figure out what to do next, I actually decided if I couldn't do weird pure mathematics anymore, that maybe I'd try to work on something in the environmental field. So I ended up looking for postdoc positions in climate science. I actually ended up in sort of the related area of climate change and economics and climate impact. So I did my postdoc at the University of Chicago and then somehow ended up at DARPA, where I guess a thread that sort of pulls through all of that work is my objectives of trying to better leverage computers and digital and IT technologies in general to improve science, to accelerate science, to make it easier to map science to actual decision making and decision support. I've been obsessed with DARPA since I was a 12-year-old computer nerd, so I pretty much, you know, every day just sort of rub my hands together in glee and feel like a kid in a candy store. So it's a pretty amazing experience. It's one I never expected with my really weird and highly theoretical sort of background. I asked why DARPA is interested in climate change. DARPA's job is to help the United States avoid strategic surprise. and. In my mind, there's, there's no bigger um, risk or strategic surprise than a sudden and massive and irreversible change in some of the key Earth systems that we rely on for survival. And Elliot says we may not have as much time as we think to solve the climate change problem. Adapting to slow, long-term temperature change seems reasonably manageable, especially for rich, developed countries. Because we think of it as, oh, okay, so it's a 0.1, 0.2, 0.5 degrees per decade. Well, we can figure out how to adapt to that slowly over time. But when you're talking about the potential for very sudden events, whether that's sudden changes in rainfall, increases in extremes, suddenly having much more intensive hurricanes, those things are much more difficult to adapt to. And we need to really understand those risks and where they are and how severe they are so that we can create adaptation strategies. There's several projects within the program. Many of them are targeting different specific tipping points that they are trying to focus on. And many of them are approaching it, obviously, with different methods, but they're also focused somewhat on solving different types of problems. One project, for example, the PI is Tim Linton from the University of Exeter. 
he's really focused on identifying better signals that can provide early warnings that tipping points are potentially about to occur. So that project in particular is how do we use our data, use our models, and use our AI to create significantly better early warning systems for tipping points that we hope might be able to give us a little bit of a runway if these things start to occur. Professor Lenton spoke to me from his office in the UK. So I'm interested in synthesizing knowledge across uh, this whole range of potential tipping points and also thinking about how they may causally interact, how tipping one thing may affect the likelihood of tipping another. And I've been particularly interested for 10 or 15 years in testing out whether mathematical methods for getting an early warning of a tipping point that are kind of well known from physics and some familiar physical systems, whether they could work in a complex climate system. And if they do, they have potential to work across a whole range of things from ice sheets and ocean circulation to the loss of bits of the biosphere or changes in atmospheric circulation. And part of the job is to work out where those methods can work and try to refine them. Linton was eager to be a part of the DARPA project. It came at just the right time, the program, as it were, because I started working with colleagues on whether if we enlisted the help of a machine learning, could we do better than ourselves as humans or mathematicians at detecting early warning signals of tipping points. And we found the machine learning was better than we are at spotting further in advance that a tipping point is coming. And it was quite good at classifying which type. What we tend to do in maths and physics is we simplify the equations, we linearize if we can, and that means we throw out some information, kind of intentionally, to make the problem manageable. <laughs> but the machine learning wasn't doing that, and it was able to see patterns that are there. I asked Lenton if there's a particular tipping point that we should be most worried about based upon his research so far. I think worry should be based on risk, which is like the combination of how likely is a bad thing to happen with how bad are the impacts of the bad thing and possibly how vulnerable are we to those impacts. We already see evidence that part of the climate system may have passed the tipping point, particularly in West Antarctica, for loss of a fair chunk of the ice sheet. But the corresponding sea level rise, although it's accelerating, it's still not spectacularly large yet. It's still a significant risk within this century that it could make a substantial contribution to sea level rise of a totaling with other factors, a meter or more. At the same time, I would say, well, there are things that can happen faster in the climate that we've also got to watch out for. So there's been a lot of interest in the possibility of abrupt changes in the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean. A lot of the focus has been on the possibility of collapsing the circulation of the whole Atlantic Ocean. Peter Domenical, the president and director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, says this would be a very big deal. If you shut it down or if you change it in any way, you can imagine that you're messing with the biggest lever of the Earth's climate system. I mean, short of changing the spinning rate of the planet, it's the biggest thing you can do. This ocean system is called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC. So the AMOC is actually a three-dimensional kind of mind-bending circulation, but it's actually really easy. It's a conveyor belt. So the upper limb of the conveyor belt, the upper part of the conveyor is the Gulf Stream. Part of that circulation just goes around and spins around the North Atlantic, but another part of it goes into the polar regions of the North Atlantic, north of Iceland. So when it goes up there, it loses a lot of its heat because it's cold up there, and it gets very cold and it's salty water. So cold, salty water is dense. It's the densest water you can make, and so it sinks. It has to go somewhere, so it actually goes along the ocean bottom at a depth of one to two miles deep in the ocean, and then actually returns to Antarctica. This circulation plays a key role in regulating our weather and climate patterns. But here's the problem. The planet is undeniably getting warmer. Greenland is melting at an accelerated rate, and so there's increased freshwater flow to the North Atlantic. Fresher water is not salty water, so it makes it fresher, means it doesn't get as dense. And the other thing that's happening is that as the sea ice has retreated now over 50% since I was born, 
it's getting a lot warmer in the Arctic. In fact, the Arctic is warming at a rate that's four times the global average. You know, if you live in the Arctic, the whole global warming question is not a question. It's like you totally are living it. It's getting warmer and it's getting fresher in the North Atlantic. And remember, that's what's required for the water to sink. For it to become denser than the water around it, it needs to be cold and salty. And it's getting warmer and fresher. And so these are some of the precursors. These are some of the things that are leading to the slowdown in AMOC circulation. And what would happen then? So basically what happens is that it's very rapid climate change, and it leads to sudden and, by human experience, unpredictable changes in the life-sustaining things that we count on from the climate system. So water supply, heat waves, and you know, the heat distribution sea level rise, you know, where, you know, basically every aspect of human existence gets thrown into uncertainty. DARPA program manager Joshua Elliott says the potential AMOC tipping point was one of the inspirations for him to take on this program. So a slowing of that might mean a significant and relatively sudden drop in temperature in Europe. A complete stopping of it could literally lead to an ice age across the entire northern hemisphere intermediate effects. You might actually see warming in Canada and cooling in Europe. So Paris might suddenly have the climate of Montreal and Montreal might suddenly have the climate of Paris. (laughs) That's sort of a swapping. But obviously these things are, they're extremely hard to predict. But what we know is that the effects would be extremely widespread, potentially extremely catastrophic, and really would reorganize the entire global structure of climate That's why Elliot is hoping to push advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning to better understand such tipping points. Our models do not have the sufficient fidelity, the sufficient accuracy to be able to represent the kinds of physical phenomenon that are necessary to understand and to predict and to put bounds on these kinds of tipping point events. And so how can we build models with better fidelity at these scales? The second goal, and maybe the biggest, broadest, more general goal, is understanding these events better, understanding the phenomena that are likely to drive them so that we can better understand perhaps how to avoid them. And then obviously trying to predict them in some sense, in a probabilistic sense, trying to put bounds on when they are likely to occur, what different levels of warming, what the probability of these devastating events is so that we can incorporate them into the kind of planning. And then finally, the third goal is actually to try and identify high value targets for data collection that can help us to better understand these systems, to better understand the risk of tipping points, to better identify or track potentially early warning signals that might help us stave off some of these tipping point events. Jennifer Sleeman at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory is another of the researchers working on this DARPA project with a focus on the potential slowing or even stopping of that Atlantic circulation. She's creating a simulated environment with competing machine learning networks. Having one of those trying to perturb and generate tipping points and having the other learn how to recognize a tipping point and also how to modify conditions to actually move away from a tipping point condition. So what happens if we change salinity by a certain amount? What does that do? Could that lead to a tipping point if you run that model out over time? And on the other side, well, if that does potentially lead to a tipping point, is there anything we can do with perturbing these other variables to counteract that in some way? We have a huge challenge here because of the sheer amount of data that's involved. It's always the more data, the merrier in an approach like this, for sure. This is DARPA program manager Joshua Elliott again. But not all data is created equal. And of course, it's a complex calculation because some data is very easy and cheap to gather, especially from satellite remote sensing, whereas other data might be extremely costly and time consuming and difficult. I asked Joshua where he hopes things will be at the conclusion of this program. The hope, uh, the expectation is that This program will help us to understand the landscape of sort of a complicated high dimensional landscape of A, what are the biggest threats that we need to be worried about, especially in the near future? B, what are the ones that we might be able to do something about? C, what of the many different cutting edge AI methods that we're employing seem to work the best in each setting, right? So trying to really accelerate what is a very nascent field of AI for earth science 
trying to really accelerate that forward by trying a whole bunch of different cutting edge tools to help to inform that landscape going forward for future research. And then B, obviously informing the data landscape. But I'd say at a broader and maybe more, I don't know if it's more personal or just more aspirational sort of level, my hope is that, you know, at the end of this, we will have sufficiently informed the DOD and the government apparatus about the existence, implications, and risks of these kinds of events that we can really get these into the conversation. Uh, Because I think it's just so critical that climate tipping points are part of the climate mitigation and climate adaptation conversation. DOD has been working and planning for a very long time on adaptation strategies for things like coastal bases that are at risk of sea level rise. And sea level rise is a particularly challenging one because anywhere you look at the global assessments of sea level rise, you'll see these sorts of long, slow, and relatively modest rises that are expected. But everybody acknowledges that there is a probability, hopefully a low probability, of a sudden acceleration in ice flow from the Antarctic ice sheets or from the Greenland ice sheets that could, you know, increase our current sea level projections by a factor of five or even 10, right? We don't know how to quantify that risk. We don't know how to put a probability, how to put a a time horizon on it. So we really can't incorporate it into our planning, but we know it's there, right? And that's what I mean by strategic surprise, right? We're doing all this effort and putting all these tools in place to plan for these eventualities. But if we only plan for the mean, then we're not planning for that potential surprise, which is, you know, exactly what DARPA is here to try and help us sort out. Thanks for joining us. Thanks also to Tom Shortridge for his partnership in producing this program. For more information on the AI-assisted climate tipping point modeling program or other work at DARPA, please visit DARPA.mil. There you will also find a link to download this podcast.